when you do applications to economics and biology, which more of you will be interested in than applications to physics, even though I think the physics stuff is kind of cool, the problem is you haven't, most of you haven't taken physics yet, as I said before, so it doesn't really work. Um, but we'll try. But by the way, a lot of you haven't taken economics, and you're not going to see this stuff in bio so fast either. So it's, it's tricky. Um, consumer surplus. Wow, you've got, you've got Okay, have any of you taken economics in high school, blah, blah, blah? Wow, not many of you. Okay. So in economics, one of the things if we think about is we think about demand, you have to think about supply. So you're manufacturing, uh, well, I don't know, iPads. And the question is, how many iPads do you make and what should you charge? So what you can do is you can set up a couple of curves. You have price here, quantity here, quantity also known as amounts. Okay, so we're selling we're selling tablets, and actually we're selling Microsoft Surface tablets, which are way better than iPads. Anyway, you disagree with that? Do you use the Surface? Um, anyway, so then the question is, what does demand look like? Well. If the price is high, you're not going to sell very many Microsoft services. If the price is low, you're going to sell a lot of them. So you get a curve. It turns out to be bowed inward for complicated reasons, which I won't worry about now. You can think of it as a straight line, but then it wouldn't be fun. Okay? And as the price comes down, you sell more of them. Duh. Okay. Now you're the other side, though. Supply. If the price is low, it doesn't make sense for you to make very many of them because you're not making very much money. As you raise the price, you have incentive to sell more of them. So the general idea of economics is this is demand, this is supply, this is the magic price. Kind of makes sense. You don't have to be too intensely mathematical. Make sense out of that. In other words, if I can't charge very much, why should I make a lot of these things? Right? If I can charge a lot, you know, if I can make a lot of money every time I sell one, then I should supply a lot of these things. But the problem is, the higher the price, the lower the demand. So there's got to be a spot in the middle where you say, that's going to get me the most number of people who will both buy and sell. Okay? So ignoring the supply part of the curve at the moment, you pick a price like there, call that P, and this is called the consumer surplus. Okay? So remember, you're charging some price, this is the number you're going to sell, and what does this money mean? What does that consumer surplus mean? <laughs> it is. Can you read off the chart? No? Uh -huh. Think about consumer surplus. Person buys the Microsoft service. No, 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 no. They, we sold this many. Okay, you sold Q at price P. So what does this amount represent? It represents the money that the consumer saved, that they would have had to spend more money, right? There's a whole area under the curve thing. This is how much profit or money the seller could have made, but this is how much money the seller actually made. <laughs> Well, if you want to be all economics, yes. But but yes, that's correct. Basically, you could have sold it for more, but you wanted to get a bigger quantity, so you sold it for less. Okay? So you kind of gave up a certain amount of profit slash money by selling it. Okay? So you call that the consumer surplus. It, it, it's much more technical than this, because there's really a lot more stuff going on. There isn't just one curve. But this is all we care about at the moment. So we want to calculate that area. Okay? For example, read this example out of the book so don't mess it up. 
The demand for a product in dollars, most of you are running out of at this point in the semester. Is where's that meal point? Have you gotten the special zone yet at meal point? By the way, there's talk that next year you're going to pay a certain amount for your meal plan and then you can eat as much as you want. Right, is that going to happen? Good. That's the way a lot of schools do it now. I mean, they charge you more and you're counting on the fact that some of you will eat a lot and, you know, others of you will eat more and it balances out. Obviously, they have people who are mathy who will figure out what price they should charge you based on the average amount that you eat. It's not really going to do you a favor, but it simplifies things. Um, anyway, so let's say this price is price is 1,200 minus 0.2x minus 0.0001x squared. That's this parabola, okay? And we want to know, so x is the quantity that you sell, and p is the price that you charge, okay? So find a consumer surplus on the sales level. I'm sorry, this is the demand. Find consumer surplus when sales equals 500 whatever. So the formula, because this is what you guys really care about, you are going to do integral from zero to your magic price sales level. Sorry, let's erase that from sales level. Of P of X minus P. Okay? Um, so first we're going to have to figure out what the price is before we figure out the second. Okay? And this is the commodity, this is the, the amount, demand, this is your price, and this is dx. Okay. So how do we figure out what p is? Well, p is found by plugging 500 into here. So first we get capital P is 1200 minus 0 0.2 times 500 minus 0 0.0001, that's actually easy, 500 square, which is 1075, 1075. So our integral becomes, the integral from 0 to 500 of 1200 minus 0.2x minus 0.0001x squared minus 1075 dx. Just that straightforward. Okay? So we can simplify that a bit. Let's see. 1200 minus 1075 is a 125 minus 0.2x minus 0.0001x squared x. That's 125x minus 0.2x squared over 2, or 0.1x squared, minus 0.0001x cubed over 3, from 0 to 500. Okay? And that gives you this area. Okay? Because you're really doing the difference between the area, between the curve and the line. Okay? We know how to find areas. The area between two things, right? to the curve in the line. So I don't care what you get when you plug that in. You get, oh, $33,333.33. That's the savings to you. Okay? So the real idea is you want to find the area between the demand curve and your sales price. Okay? So you find your sales price by taking the level that you're going to sell, the number you're going to sell, Plug them in the quantity formula, okay? That gives you the price, 
Okay? And then you take the formula, you take the curve minus that price, and you integrate over your sales level. Should we do an example? Sure. Let's do a nice easy one. The demand for a certain commodity is P is 20 minus 0.05x. Find the consumer surplus. And the sales level is 300. Let's look suspicious of that problem number four. Let's work on this problem for the next. Okay, demand for product is law. So you can do the same thing as before, yes? Well, you have scrap paper, so I don't know if we'll have a problem like this, and I don't know what the arithmetic level is for one. We'll find out. I'm not doing it to be annoying, like I'm not in charge. So first, you find P is 20 minus 0.05 times 300. I know you guys hate fractions, but it is easier if you do it as a fraction. This is 20 minus 120th of 300. 120th of 300 is 15, so this comes out 5. Okay. Feeling of satisfaction. You only need to use the fingers of one hand so far. Okay. Integral from 0 to 300. 20 minus 0.05x plus 5. I am sympathetic to the no calculator issue. No, you have not. It's just, you know, that's just the way it is. Something's not changing. Okay. Wait, whoa. That was a two pack reference. I'm sorry? My spot. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so that's from 0 to 300. 15 minus 0.05x. Dx. You break that. You get 15x minus 0.05x squared over 2, 0 to 300. So look, if you get to there, you're going to get most of the points. Okay? So I am sympathetic. If you want to do that last little step, you could also say this is 15x minus x squared over 40 from 0 to 300. Okay? That's 4,500 minus 90,000 over 40, which is 2,250. Very good. Which equals 2,250. Okay? How could you, if you had to do this, how would you do that? Because you might have to do arithmetic on the test. You do 300 squared, don't do 300 squared, do 300 times 300 over 40. Okay? Cancel a 0. Do 4 go to cancel that and get a 15. So now you have 300 times 15 over 2. Cancel another 2. Now it's just 150 times 15. It's easier that way. Okay? You know what? <coughs> oh, I don't know. That could be. That's the way I would do it. Okay. I mean, I start, I always do reduction before I actually do the arithmetic. All right. So that's one kind of thing you might have to do. Let's look at another type of practice problem. Okay, so let's do a disease model. Because we know you guys love disease. Suppose you want to find the number of cases of a disease in some certain period of time. So let's say the equation. Okay. 
Okay, this is the number of people who are going to come down with a zombie flu in the first per hour, where tea is out. So you get a lot of zombies later. Okay. So this is the rate of increase in zombies. When the zombies come, I'm standing behind Odin. Let them get you first. They're going to be busy munching for a while. It'll be time to run away. All right. So if we want to find, say, how many more zombies do we get between, oh, I don't know, 10 hours and 14 hours? If we just integrate from 10 to 14, the zombie rate. Just that simple. It's going to happen one of these days. It's going to be the zombies. I'm hiding down here, below ground, closing those doors, you guys don't know. Okay, meet here with OD. Oh, apparently not Chris. All right, so this is an easy integral, right? This is 2,500T plus e to the 0.6T over 0.6 from 10 to 14. And that's messy. Yes? Where did I get the what? Oh, I said I'm doing it for 10 hours to 14 hours. So the, the increase in zombies is between 10 hours and 14 hours. When you do the increase, okay, we're to find the number that the population has gone up. Okay, <coughs> in total, you're going to integrate the change. Because what happens when you do the integral of the derivative? Well, you get z, right? So, because that's, that's derivative in Z, that's the change in Z. So when you integrate going backwards, you can get Z. So this is going to give you the number of zombies at the 14th hour, the number of zombies at the 10th hour, you take the difference, and that gives you the number of zombies between the 10th and the 14th hour. Okay? That's how much the zombie population went up. We see them on campus every year, we attack them with Nerf guns. In real life, that's not going to work. Okay. I don't care what that comes out of. Do we care? All right, so we can do another example from the book. A hot, wet summer is causing a Zika mosquito population explosion in the Lake Resort area. Don't go to Brazil this summer. Okay. The number of mosquitoes increasing at... Okay. So the rate of increase of mosquitoes... Is let's see the MDT is twenty two hundred plus N E to the point eight. T. How much does the mosquito population increase? Boy, people are chatty today. Yes. Okay. So the rate of increase of mosquitoes is the MDT is 2200 plus 10 e to the point HT. By how much does the mosquito population increase between week five and week nine? Nice. All right, let's do this one. This is a very straightforward, much easier than all that physics stuff, right? So, we waited in, so we want to know how much the population increases between week five and week nine. Now we're going to integrate the rate that the mosquitoes are changing, because that'll give us the total number of mosquitoes 
between the fifth week and the ninth week. So we're just going to integrate this. And for those of you who forget, the integral of e to the kx is e to the kx over k. The reason it's divided by k is take the derivative. When you take the derivative of this, you get e to the kx times k. Just take the derivative of the power, and that cancels the k's out. So that's why you need to divide by that number when you're doing the end of derivative. Okay? So here, we get 2200t plus 10 e to the point ht over point 8 from 5 to 9. Point 8 is 4 fifths, right? So, you should be able to do that. Let's see. That is 19,800 plus 12.5 uh, e to the 7.2 minus 11,000 plus 12.5 e to the 4. I don't know. Those are big numbers. Okay? Lots of mosquitoes, lots of Zika. What happens if you get the Zika virus? You just feel a cold, right? We're not even sure yet if there's actually a link. They're working on it. There seems to be a link, though. Um, so I'm not sure which problems she did. Now we do one more pressure problem, then I'm moving back to the, then we're going to start review. A little water. And the dimensions of this tank are uh, 4 by 5 by 2. It's filled with water. And you've got a little hole in the top of the tank. And you're now going to attach a hose to the top of the tank. You're going to pump the water out. You're going to suck the water out of the tank. Okay? How much work would you be doing? So you say to yourself, well, what am I doing? I'm lifting water. Okay? Remember, work is the force that you have to exert times the distance over which the force is exerted which the force is exerted over, okay? Not actually ending a sentence in a preposition when you say something exerted over, because over is acting as an adverb, it's modifying exert, so you can say it that way. You can say over which the force is exerted, you just sound like this. Glad you had the English lesson thrown in for those of you who didn't take advanced grammar. Right? So then the time, next time somebody says, the person to whom I'm talking, they're wrong, it's the person I am talking to. Right? <coughs> Talking about is different from talking to, is talking with, so the, the preposition is actually modifying talking. But I digress. So, we have, you imagine that you have a little slice of the water, that the width of that slice is dx, okay? And it's, it's a box, it's a square shape, or rectangular shape, water like this. Good enough. So what's the volume of that water? Well, the volume of that water would be 4 by 5 by dx. So the volume would be 4 times 5 times dx. Density of water, well, let's put this in meters. Or actually, two centimeters, sorry. No, meters, never mind. Okay, I gotta use 9.8. Density of water is what? A thousand, very good, okay. So the, the mass of the water is 1,000 times 20, at 20 dx. It's really delta x, okay? But when we do the actual calculus, it turns into dx. 
Okay, then the weight of the water is the force of gravity acting on that water, and the force is mg, where g is 9.8. When I teach physics, I use 10. I don't bother with 9.8 because it makes the math easier. Okay. So, and those of you just got excited, no, I'm not teaching physics or sewing book anytime soon. <coughs> Sorry about that. All right. So, here, the force would be 20,000 dx times 9.8. Okay? Which is 196,000 yeah, so that's the force we're going to need. And the work is integral of F X. Or, and we're going to lift it how far? We're going to lift it 2 meters. So it's going to be the integral from 0 to 2 of 196,000. I put an extra 0 in here, did not? Right. Thanks, Obama. Anyway, <laughs> um, and then I have to multiply that by x, dx. Okay, so that's the work it'll take to pump all of that water out. By the way, if it wasn't water, what if it was oil? Well, all that would happen is instead of multiplying by a thousand, you multiply by the appropriate density, which you use the letter rho. If you use the density of oil, what's denser, water or oil? Water is more dense, the oil floats on top. Hence the phrase oil slick, right? Just what's more dense, cream or milk? Milk. You ever saw old fashioned milk? The cream sits on top. Anyway, um, well, if you put cream in your coffee, it stays on the top. You have to stir it in. Yes. Why is it X? Because the work is the force times X. So this now becomes uh, 98,000 x squared from 0 to 2. So that's 98,000 times 4 minus 0, which is 392,000 uh, joules. Okay? Yes? Yes. Sure. This is not f of x, it's x. It's the force times this. It's actually f dot x, but I understand. That would be hydrostatic force. Just hydro because it's water. Okay? But it's essentially, you know, well, I'll give you an example. We're going to open the swimming pool here at Stony Brook in a little while. Okay? And the swimming pool has a floor that you can be able to raise and lower, which is really cool. So they can be able to have like aqua therapy. You're going to get the water level to say here, and then they're going to raise the water level and you can swim. Okay? So what would you do? I mean, it's an Olympic sized swimming pool. There's a lot of water in an Olympic sized swimming pool. It weighs a lot. It also takes a long time to fill up a swimming pool like that. So what would you do to raise and lower the floor? So you sit there and you say, look, if I want to raise the floor, I'm pumping all of that water out of the tank. Okay? That's an incredible amount of work. So, or you could have a second floor that sort of sits on top of the floor. That floor could be porous. And then you just have to lift basically a screen, which still weighs a lot, okay? Because it's going to be a screen the size of an Olympic pool, okay? Um, and it's going to be fighting the water as it comes up, but the water goes through the holes. So what do you think would be, since some of you want to be engineers, what are the problems when you lift that screen? What do you want to keep it from doing? To bend, twist, to make it, you want to make it rigid, it could sag in the middle. Yeah, it's a complicated problem. Okay? So you can have it in pieces, lifted in multiple stages. You can lift it very slowly. Okay? But it's a tricky problem. But that's where hydrostatic pressure, well, hydrostatic pressure really shows up in things like, you know, you're pumping the oil, and the gas out of your gas tank, or out of the gas uh, tank at the station and into the gas in your car, right? Or you're 
suctioning the water gas out of the abandoned car so you get your car to escape from the zombies. Right. Okay. So, on that note, we're going to shift into review for the final. Now, we have not yet circulated the final. But the final is comprehensive. Cumulative, whatever you call it, it's going to be comprehensive and cumulative. So you have to ask yourself, what have we done in class? Well, first thing we did was we just kind of learned what an antiderivative is, an integral is. An integral is derivative backwards. So you have to be able to anti-differentiate things. Very simple things, like polynomials, trig functions, E, 1 over X, etc. That's the first thing you have to be able to do. Then, we talked about what an integral really is. We did Riemann sums. Those were fun. No? Those were not fun? No? It was painful? More painful than second grade? Really? Tell us about your pain. Okay. Then, we did technique of integration for so long that we just lost track of time. It was so much fun. And now, we did applications. Area, volume, arc length, average value, physics, business, and biology. I think that's pretty much everything we did. Did I leave anything out? The volume, the area. We did, oh, we did in-depth improper integrals. Those are always entertaining. We skipped approximate integration because I think it's snow. It's fun when you lose like five classes of snow. I pretty much factor that into my, my syllabus these days because you know, we did lots and lots of integrals. So, to go back to the beginning, let's make sure that we can just do some basic integration. So once again, by the way, I will put up some review problems at some point after I've seen the exam. However, the truth is, the review packets for the first two midterms, you should just do them again. Okay? You should redo your midterms. You want to know what Professor Tanase's exams look like? You now have two of them. Okay? You should redo your midterms. You should read through the chapters so that you can understand some of the concept stuff. Okay? Some of that true false stuff. I would try to read through it. After all, you all bought the book, right? Nope. I'll see if I can find some additional pages to put up that might be helpful. Also, looking at the stuff from my book is really much more just sort of mechanical. My book is not a theoretical book. It's an easy calculus study guide. Although, astonishingly, there are classes that use it as a textbook. I'm happy, but they didn't ask me. Every time they buy a book, I get a dollar, so I'm not really complaining. Um, all of a sudden, I got much more attractive than that. Have you noticed how handsome Gus Connors is? He's single. Yeah. Anyway, um, but that's what I recommend. I would do odd problems from the textbook. You know, you have lots of spare time. It's not like you have any other classes, right? So, I mean, you could just sit here now and just do math for a week. That's 168 hours. No, you have more than that. You have 200 and 10 hours. What are you Okay, 210 hours. Get cracking. So, nightmare's almost over, folks. Okay, so you don't need to differentiate that. That's a pie at the end. Alright, let's be sure to be able to do that. Because now this looks easy. Remember at the beginning you were having trouble with this. So this is 5x to the 4 over 4 minus 3x to the 3 over 3, also known as the old x cubed, plus 4x to the 2 over 2, which is 2x squared, plus pi pi x, plus the constant. Did the ta subtract it, which I didn't write the plus c? No? 
I hope not. I mean, you should write it. You're wrong if you don't. But you kind of need to beat people up for that. So you should all be able to do the integral of the form x to the n. You should know that that's x to the n plus 1 over n plus 1 plus a constant. So far, so good? All right. Now, of course, I can make this mess here. By giving you some more annoying ones. Okay, so what's the integral of sine of 4x? Well, what's the derivative of sine is cosine, so the integral of sine is minus cosine. Divided by 4. How about 2 over x? 2 log x. Don't forget your absolute value bars. E to the pi x is e to the pi x over pi. Let's see. Don't forget that. Those are my exact words. So as a reminder, integral of the sine of kx dx is minus cosine kx over k. The integral of the cosine of kx dx is the sine of kx over k plus c. The integral of dx over ax plus b is the natural log of ax plus b over a. How are you doing so far? Good? You can do these basic integrals, right? These seemed hard at the time, but now you got them, right? Okay, let's do a couple more just to make sure. Sorry, just to make sure. What did we want to do? We need to go to the square root of x, but same as x to the half, right? So that becomes x to the 3 halves over 3 halves. We need to go secant squared x is tangent of x. And you need to go 1 over 1 plus x squared is inverse tan of x. Also known as arc tan of x. Plus c. You got that one? Good. Okay, let's do another messy one. I'm getting into good stuff on Wednesday. I'm just doing basics now. Of you. 
and now you substitute back in, and you get negative log cosine of x plus c. That's also, by the way, the log of the secant of x plus c. Because you take the negative 1, you put it up, and you get cosine to the negative 1, and cosine to the negative 1 is 1 over cosine, which is secant. So sometimes you'll see this in books. Sometimes we'll see this in books. Okay? There's some more ones to memorize. The integral of C into that. And we did a little trick for that one. And that is the log of C to X plus tangent of x plus c. Okay, so it's two more of your collection. I mean, one thing I recommend you do in the next couple of days is try to make a page with, pretend that you can take a bigger page into the exam and start working on what you want on the page. Okay? And of course you just do reduction to get it down to that quarter piece of paper. So far, so good. And do you remember where this came from? You multiply top and bottom by c of x plus tangent of x, and then you could do a u substitution. You doing okay so far? Let's give you one slightly messier one. Substitution. Let u equal 1 plus x squared. You guys are getting the hang of this. You remember you had problems before, but now you're comfortable with it. Du is 2x dx. Which means a half of du equals x dx. So this now becomes 1 half integral of square root of u du. So far, so good. Okay, the integral of the square root of u, this is one half, u to the three halves over three halves, which with the magic of algebra becomes u to the three halves, one third u to three halves plus c, which we now substitute back. We get one third, one plus x squared, three halves, plus c. So far, so good? All right. Now, what about the second one? Well, let u equal one plus x. du is dx, right? You can get, but what about this x here? Well, u minus one is x. So this now becomes the integral of u minus 1 times the square root of u du. <coughs> it's the integral of u to the 3 halves minus u to the 1 half du. Isn't that clever? So again, if u is 1 plus x, then u minus 1 is x. So now you can go and for x you substitute u minus 1, for 1 plus x you substitute u, and then if you distribute that square root of u, you get u to the 3 halves minus u to the 1 half. That's u to the 5 halves over 5 halves minus u to the 3 halves over 3 halves plus c, which is 2 fifths of 1 plus x five halves minus two thirds one plus x to the three halves plus c. Okay? How are we doing on u substitution? Alright, I think that's enough for today. I'll see everybody on Wednesday. We'll do a lot more review.